Bueno, pues buenos días a todos nuevamente. Comenzamos con las presentaciones. La primera, la primera ponente que tenemos es Ulrike Mangold, que es la responsable de las listas de reserva dentro de EPSO, de la Oficina de Selección de la Unión Europea, a la que quiero agradecer mucho su presencia hoy aquí, porque ha venido de Bruselas específicamente para esta jornada. O sea, bueno, muchas gracias y nada, te doy ya. Buenos días. Bueno, ya sabe quién soy, Ulrike Mangold. Soy alemana, pero hablo un poquito el castellano, eh, solo para demostrarles que hablo el castellano y entiendo, creo que, todo. <risa> eh, al final, cuando yo he terminado con mi exposición, pueden preguntar preguntas en castellano. Las voy a comprender, ent entender. Quizás respondo en, en inglés o, el, eh, o en castellano. ¿De acuerdo? Ahora, quisiera saber quién habla o entiende el inglés. Que levante la mano. Beautiful. <risa> Okay, <laughs> because I'm supposed to do this uh, little presentation in English. Um, I have a slight accent maybe, so I'll speak very slowly and hopefully quite clearly. I've decided to take this microphone to have it closer to my mouth. So if you don't hear me, you just shake your, mouth, you shake your head, okay? So EPSO um, selects the staff for all institutions in the EU. You have the logos of every single one of them. And I'm not sure whether you can see the numbers in, in red, um, whether they're clear enough, but you can see the numbers of staff that each institution has. And it's quite clear that the um, commission has, it's over there, yeah, it's not very clear, it has the biggest staff number. So they are our biggest clients, clearly. Then it says any agencies, now we don't actually um, organize competitions for the agencies, but they are allowed to recruit from our reserve list as of a certain point in time. Not the, at the very beginning, because the reserve lists are only um, for the institutions that asked for laureates in that specific field. But at a certain point in time, and I can go into that a little bit later, the reserve list becomes free, and other institutions that had not asked for quota, and also agencies are allowed to recruit from there. So those are your, thank you. Let's have a look at some figures. So EPSO has been in existence since 2003, and since then uh, we have had more than 500,000 candidates. We've organized more than 700 open competitions. It makes me smile because <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, and more than 17,000 successful candidates we've, we've selected. 12,000 of them have been recruited so far. I'm going to get... In 2008, probably a little bit before then even, but it became very clear that we had to change the procedures. Um, we are going to, we're facing a, quite a significant turnover of staff within the next 10 years. Between a third and half of our staff are going to go into retirement. So obviously we had to, or we know that we have to, um, cater the institutions with laureates to fill these, these posts. We were also quite um, aware of the fact that our competition model was based on a model from the 1950s, so way outdated. It also it took way too long to select the people and afterwards to recruit them. The reason for that was that basically the, the demand came at a certain point in time but the laureates were ready to be recruited way later. So there was, there was a dismatch between the, the need and the availability of the, of the laureates. So we noticed, obviously, that the procedure has to become much shorter already because of that. And also, in order to attract the most qualified, the most talented people. So in order to successfully um, compete in the war, of talent, war for talent. Because what we saw was the most brightest, they would go to the private sector, we wouldn't get them. Because once they'd been out of the university, they were gone. They were not interested in a procedure of two years hanging around and waiting to be recruited. So then we launched a major overhaul of our procedures. Which goes on until today, by the way. They're tweaked all the time. We are very interested in what other international organizations do, and our director, together with other staff, they, they go to other international organizations to see how they do their recruitment procedure to get ideas and incorporate them into our procedure whenever 
whenever possible. Always for the same reason, in order to attract the best of the best. Okay? So here, we, that was one of the, the new features. It wasn't that institutions would ask for a certain type of laureates at a certain point in time, and then we just launch a comp competition. No. We have a cycle, an annual cycle, which is great for the laureate, for, for anybody, not the laureate, sorry, for, for the candidates, because they know exactly when, so for instance, for the AD uh, competitions, when during the year, that would be in spring, a competition will be launched, yes? So during that time in spring, for the AD cycle, you have your registration and your self-assessment. The self-assessment is done during the registration procedure. Then in summer, you will have your CBT, so that's the, the test, but I'll go a little bit more into detail, uh, the test that you will do in your member state or wherever you live. Then you have, if you were successful in the CBT, you will go on to the assessment center, you'll be invited to that. And recruitment starts, well, after the autumn, going towards winter. Um, if you look at the cycle here, it looks like recruitment takes place in about three months. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. Um, a reserve list is in the general list, um, department is uh, valid for one year, but for instance, the competition or the reserve list that was launched in 2010, we have extended the, ex the um, validity of that reserve list by a few months because we still have a few laureates, well, quite a few laureates left, and we want them to all be recruited, which is why the next cycle, the institutions asked for less laureates, just to make sure that the ones from 2010 do get their possibility to, to be recruited, okay? Then here you have the next color is the um, linguist cycle. It's, it starts in summer, registration, self-assessment. Autumn, you have the CBT. And the, the other details of that, um, of the different um, parts of the um, procedure I'll go into later. And then the assessment center is in winter. And then the next cycle, the ASD cycle. ASD cycle starts in winter and so on, yes, CBT is in spring, assessment is in summer, and recruitment starts as of autumn. We have worldwide testing, so that means we have assessment, uh, sorry, not assessment centers, we have the, the CBT tests uh, centers in 78 test centers on all continents. 37 are outside of the EU, which that is great, that did not exist before either. People that lived in, happens, right? They're in, interested in working for us, but they live in New Zealand, Australia, or whatever. They, they had to go to a, a member state of the EU. They had to travel. And at that point in time, that part, they had to pay themselves. So I think that's a great advance um, that we've made there. So I already said we're looking for people who are highly skilled, resilient, and motivated. I'm going to go into the competences competencies that we test a little bit later. Um, we're also interested, obviously, in people that are interested in learning, in developing, not people that just want to come and sit nice and cushy in their office and just enjoy a, a cushy, easy life, yes? Um, we're looking for people. <laughs> we're looking for people that want to make or desire to make a difference and want to shape Europe and with that influence also the whole world. Um, now, how do you test that? At the very beginning, um, when you do your, your application, we ask you to write a motivation letter. And we've noticed, in fact, that most laureates say, no, nobody's going to read this. And they don't put too much emphasis on this, and they don't put very much thought into that. Just a little parenthesis here. Put enough thought into your motivation letter, because we will come back to that, to your motivation of why you want to work for the EU later on. And then, of course, it's very important that you want to, it's already been um, um, spoken about a little bit, that you like to work in a multicultural environment, which is absolutely thrilling, it is true, to, to be, you know, side by side by, to anybody from the EU, it's very interesting. Um, but it does also has its challenges, which makes it even more interesting. I think it doesn't, you know, you don't get bored, for sure. It's very, very enriching. And we are looking for people that deliver results, of course. So the competency-based testing, let me just go over here. The competency-based testing, testing, there's the self-assessment, as I said, which you're invited to do at the stage of the online application. 
Afterwards, you have the competency-based pre-selection, which is the CBT. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. Then you have the assessment centers. And then afterwards, whether you pass or you don't pass, you get a competency passport. I have an image of a competency passport a little bit later on also. This competency passport just shows very graphically, graphically and also in little, in little paragraphs how you've done throughout the test. And even if you didn't make it this time, maybe you want to retry to do another competition another time, it'll be helpful for you to see where you were weak. So you, it'll help you to study or improve in certain areas. And also, if you decided you didn't, in the end, that you wanted to work somewhere else, not for the EU, it's always interesting. So there's something, the least that you get out of participating in a, in a competition, that's the competency passport, right? Which is very helpful. So we've um, crystallized eight competencies. Seven of them are for everybody, so that's at AD and ASD level. AD standing for administrators, ASD for assistants, and the eighth is for the AD levels only. So let's, I'm not sure whether you can read it, so I'm just going to go through them very quickly maybe, and maybe discuss a tiny, tiny little bit. The first one is analysis and problem solving. It means that you need to be able to identify critical facts in complex issues, and that you need to be able to develop creative and practical solutions always within the procedures, of course. So you need to know a little bit about the procedures and Common sense, of course, always helps. Communicating. We need somebody who communicates clearly and precisely, both orally and in writing. And in writing, for instance, orally and in writing, that also means in your second language, something that I'll come back to later. But one of the reasons why I'm speaking right now in English is, is precisely that. You see that you have to be fluent. You have to be able to express yourself fluently in an oral manner and also in a written manner. Um, we're looking for people that deliver quality and results. So we're asking you or we're looking for someone who takes responsibility and initiative and delivers work of a high standard, high quality, within a time limit, and of course always according to procedures. So some creativity is good, but always you have to stick to procedures, of course. Learning and development, we like to have people that are willing to learn lifelong learning, um, that are willing to improve their per personal skills and also the knowledge of the organization in general. Not only their unit <laughs> that does exist, colleagues that are just interested in their unit, in their little work in the unit, no, you must be interested in the whole organization of your institution, but also how does the, the entire EU function basically, how do the institutions um, work with each other. Prioritizing an organization or organizing, that's quite clear. As in, in any job, really, it's a huge opportunity to, um, possible, a huge advantage to be able to prioritize um, and crystallize the important tasks, but also be flexible. If you think you have to do this, this, this today, something else comes, this is major urgent, you have to be able to prioritize clearly. Resilience remains effective under a heavy workload, handles organizational frustrations, they also exist in the EU, positively and adapts to a changing work environment. Working with others there, we will need to see that you are able to work in a group. You will see where that is during the assessment center later. And that you're also maybe um, able to work with other cultures, which, as I said before, brings its challenges. And then for AD, candidates, um, so people that are applying to become administrators, we also need to see a quality of leadership. Yes, manages, develops, and motivates people to achieve results. I'm just reading it out because I'm not sure whether you can read it. If I, could I have people nodding or shaking their head? Can you read the slides? Yes, no? You cannot. I'll keep reading then, shall I? Very good. So the competent, the um, the testing for competency, the first one is the CBT. This one is done in your member state. It's done on a PC. And there you have three types of tests for sure, abstract, verbal, and numerical reasoning. And this little graph that you can see that I think you, you can see, it shows that there is, there is a part always to each test is specific knowledge. 
And the, where they overlap is the general knowledge that we expect everybody to have. Um, and then depending on the competition, there might be a situational or behavioral test. And uh, we might be testing professional competencies and even a second language. This test, by the way, the CBT test is done in your first language. Here you have the link. I'm not sure whether you will be able, I guess you will be able to get um, copies of the slides maybe on the website afterwards. So if you click on this link, you get, detail, you get um, examples for the tests. Um, we'll come back to that later, and I, I know that Mrs. Moya will talk about it also, uh, that the member states pre prepare their uh, aspirants for the competitions. And, um, but you yourself, you go on, the, go on the link and see what kind of tests you will be presented with and practice them. The CBT test is probably the most stressful. You need to acquire an 80 or 90 percent um, in those tests. And the worst about the tests, I would say, and anybody would say, is the time pressure. So it's really about being able to answer, to, to crystallize the answer quickly and answer quickly. And yes, that can be practiced, yes? If you have gotten through that stage and you are amongst the best, X number, you are invited to the assessment center. I'll go later on into how you find out whether you have passed or you have not passed that stage. Depending on the selection procedure, there will be a case study in the field in question. There will be an exercise or exercises relating to the professional skills, an oral presentation. We'll go into a little bit more detail later also. A structured interview and a group exercise. And there might be practical language tests. So here you see for generalists in the assessment center, um, the Examples of the fields, we've already heard them before, European Public Administration, Economics, Law, Audit, Statistics, Finance, and ICT. Um, we organize these competitions at 85 and 87 level. We've already heard that also. And in this graph, in this table, you can see how we test those competencies, the ones I've just been um, talking about, the eight or seven or eight competencies. So let's have a quick look at that. For instance, analyzing and problem solving is tested in the case study and also in the oral presentation. So you see that every, um, every competency which you see on the left hand side is tested twice. One way or another, it's tested twice, so each of the competencies has two crosses. Okay? The one that, is, that has only one cross at the very bottom, grayed out, you cannot see it for sure, it's technical expertise is only tested in the case study, but the case study is corrected by two assessors. So we understand also that it is tested twice because it's assessed, it's assessed or corrected by two assessors. The case study is organized simultaneously for all candidates in the same field. It's part of the assessment center, but organized prior to the assessment center day on PC in the member states. For the exact details of how the competition works, the one you will apply for, in fact, you should, in any case, read the official journal very carefully and the guide for candidates. That's before you even start filling in your application form. So I'm going through general points right now, but whatever at whatever stage you decide to participate, and for whatever competition you decide to participate, you must read the official journal very carefully to know how it's going to run. Okay? In the group exercise, you have four to six participants. Um, and we've seen before, if we just go backwards for a second. Can we? No, we cannot. Anterior. There you go. In the group exercise, we, we test with how you work with others, and you're stuck in, in your structural interview also we, will, uh, we test how you work with others. But also in the group exercise, we test whether you know how to prioritize, pri prioritize and organize, <laughs> prioritize, and learning and development. So within a group, there is learning going on, right? You, s you have to d react uh, to how other people organize, how other people act at that point in time, 
And you have to learn to adapt to that, yes? Then there's an oral presentation given by the candidate, and the questions to that oral presentation will be asked by two assessors. Everything is based on EU-based scenarios in all these three exercises. So case study, group exercise, and oral presentation are EU-based scenarios. In addition to the structured interview, in addition, there's a structured interview, yes, based on the uh, general competencies. The assessment center is the tests or the exams there are run in your second language. Um, and the second language for everybody needs to be either English, French, or German. So I suppose that for all of you, your first language is Spanish. Easy, you just choose between the three. But for instance, in my case, I'm German. I have to change, I, have to, I cannot do that test, for instance, in, in German. German is my first language, I have to choose, I would have had to choose a second language, being English or French. Is everything clear up to here? Can I have a reaction? Yes, <laughs> kind of like, very good, maybe yes, if I stand up again. So here, here we have just a timetable of an assessment center. Um, just to show you how it goes, everybody's invited at the same time, and you see that you're there the entire day, okay, from the morning until the afternoon. And what we're doing, we're simulating a stressful day at the office in one of the EU institutions. It's really not, it feels, it doesn't feel like exam, 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 or test, 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 a little bit like at the university or at school. No, it really feels like a day at work in one of the institutions. Quite practical. And then we're doing the same thing here. You will see that um, for specialists, the testing is, um, or how we test the competencies is just slightly different, but always every single competency is tested twice. Um, so for instance, let me just take another um, um, example. Let me take leadership. Leadership is tested, for instance, in a group exercise and in the competency-based interview. And just like I said before, the case study is EU-based scenario, organized simultaneously for all candidates, organized separately from the assessment center on paper or on PC in Brussels or in the member states. And again, here for the details, just go back to the official journal whenever you apply for it. The group exercise, two structured inf interviews based on general competencies and knowledge in the field. And again, these tests are done in your second language, English, French, or German. Here you have some uh, examples for specialist profiles. By the way, the specialist competitions are launched at least twice. There are at least two cycles within one year. I don't think I said that before. So spatial sciences, anybody here for spatial sciences? <laughs> Environmental sciences, chemistry, biology, health, quantitative policy analysis, physics, energy sciences. And I think I'll jump the next one because I'll come back to that later. Here. I'm sorry that you cannot see it very well, but this is the image of the competency passport. This competency passport, as I said before, you will receive it at the end of the, the competition. You don't receive one, obviously, if you, if you gave up halfway through the test or something, then you don't get a competency passport, that is, that is clear. Otherwise, you do get it, whether you passed or not, uh, and it'll be, it's for your own use, very in interesting, but if you've made it, if you are one of the laureates and you get onto the reserve list, this is what the institutions will use, amongst other things, um, to, to, have a, to, to choose the laureate they would like to invite for interviews, they would like to recruit. I'm saying that there's a, there are other things that they will look at. Um, I'm not sure, can, can you please put your hand up real quick, who has an EPSO account already? What is an EPSO account? I'll get that to that later. Okay, some of you do. Now you see in the EPSO account there is a tab where you can update, upload your um, CV online, and that's something you should do constantly, because when it gets to this stage, saying that you're a laureate, um, the, the, that's what the institutions look at also. So who can apply for um, the competitions? The basic requirement, obviously, is that you are a member or that you're a citizen of one of the 27 member states. That's an absolute um, must. Uh, you have to know your language plus one foreign, foreign language, and one of them, um, the second language, must be English, French, or German. 
And then there are some requirements that have to be met. They're, always, they're stipulated, they're um, set out in the notice of competition. I'll just quickly go over the uh, qualification implications because the next slide actually has, has both. Um, in order to apply for an administrator cycle, um, you have to have had a, or you have to have obtained a university degree, a bachelor. And in, if you are, for instance, in your, I see young people in the audience, if you are in your latest, in, in your last year of studies, you can already apply uh, for the competition and as long as you get your degree by the 31st of July, 2012. And then, sorry. Excuse me, I'm just going to make sure I don't miss out anything. So I'm just going to take the second while I'm flipping my pages. Is, are there any questions up until here? Not just yet. Okay, but you're still with me, yes? Still awake? Good stuff. Very good. So um, in order to apply for an assistant post, you have to be, have completed a higher secondary education and you have, must have a relevant professional experience and I'll go back go into that now. And this is something I will actually read out in, mo in order to make sure I don't make any mistakes so, and I don't miss out on anything. So for the professional experience requirements at an 80 and eight, uh, 85 and 6 um, level, you must have uh, completed university studies uh, of at least three years. Um, so this, as I say, I'm going to read out very quickly. The minimum re qualifications required from an administrator competition is a three-year university degree or equivalent. Depending on the field of the competition, this qualification may need to be in a specific subject. For instance, a law degree for a lawyer competition. Clear. 85 is the grade at which graduates enter an administrator's career in the institutions. So that means that person wouldn't have had any professional experience, most probably, or any ex professional experience that would be counted. Um, administrators recruited at this grade can undertake under supervision three main types of work in the institutions. Um, and those are policy formulation, operational delivery, and resource management. For co competitions at this grade, no professional experience is required. We are particularly looking for candidates with a potential for career development. Generalist assistance competitions may be organized at two different entry grades. Not sure whether this is very interesting for anybody that is here, but I'll still say it. ASD1 and ASD3, yes? The entry requirements differ between the two levels. For ASD1, a post-secondary qualification in a subject relevant to the field of the competition is needed. Uh, for instance, a secretarial diploma for a secretary um, or a higher secondary school diploma and relevant professional experience. For instance, two years working as a secretary. So that's for the ASD1. For, a secretary, um, for ASD3, more than three years of relevant professional experience has to, um, has to be, uh, is required. Details of the qualifications and professional experience required for each competition are set out in the notice of competition, so we always refer back to that. You always must go back and, and read that. And here we have examples of job profiles that I think you can read. Um, so maybe on the left-hand side, administrators have a look what um, could interest you. But it's, it does say etc. Yes. <laughs> um, now let me just say something. For instance, if you um, pass a translator's competition, this is just an example, you can only be recruited as a translator. That is a priori. So at the, at the recruitment, you can only be um, um, recruited as a translator. But what can happen is after a certain amount of years, between two and three years, there is internal mobility, not only within your institution, but also between the institutions. And you could change over and apply internally for another post, which has nothing to do with translation. I think that's also something interesting to keep in mind. What do we have to offer? We offer a lifetime of different jobs. As I just said, you might start as a translator, but after a while say, mm, I've done enough translations now, I'm really interested in X. And you have a look around, uh, 
their systems, IT systems, to, to see what vacancies are available, and you might apply for another job. As I say, within your own institution or another institution, you might want to change from Brussels to Luxembourg. Also something that you have to keep in mind, we have two places where these posts are Brussels and Luxembourg, mainly in Brussels, but also in Luxembourg. Uh, you, have, you get the opportunity to work and travel abroad. Um, you know, we have the external action service, so with, oh, if you work there, you can be placed in a different country. Um, and then also you get to travel abroad, just like me today, for instance, yes? Um, we encourage everybody to learn new skills, especially languages. Um, we, we're supposed to, in fact, to, to do training every, every year. Um, that's something obligatory, actually. Language is highly encouraged. You have to enter with two languages that we've seen already, but for your first promotion, you have to show that you are quite fluent and you, that you can work with a third language. Otherwise, there's no promotion. We have an attractive benefits package, something I will get into a little bit later, um, and also a little bit maybe on the salary might be interesting. Yes? Um, <laughs> and then we offer interesting and challenging work that makes a real difference in Europe, and that is true. So, I, I mean, I've said it, is it, I'm worried a little bit to say the same thing twice. Um, it's an environment where you're encouraged to learn new skills all the time, and you develop, so you come in as one person, but you keep developing, and that's what we're interested in, somebody who is interested in, in learning, adding new skills, adding new, um, learning new languages. The, fle the working conditions in the institutions are flexible. They change slightly from one institution to another, but for instance in the Commission, I know for sure, and also in EPSO, we have flexi time, meaning that you, 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 you um, introduce, introduce your time hours the hours you've worked every day in a system, and then if you have overtime, you can recuperate this time, if your boss <laughs> says yes. <laughs> well, there is the possibility to do part-time. There are certain requirements for that. For clearly, if you have children, uh, whether you're a man or woman, you can apply for that, and there's no question asked. When you have children, you can apply for part-time, and as um, I believe that it's usually or almost, uh, it's always accepted. There's um, the possibility to do some teleworking. Who's into that? I don't know. Um, we do have parental leave, so um, when you have small children, uh, you can take a certain amount of time off. I'm not quite sure how much right now. And you can take it at any point in time. It doesn't have to be when the, the baby is just born or anything. And you can take career breaks. Let's say you have something, uh, a passion um, outside your work, you can just take a break, or for whatever reason you want to travel the world, you take a break, a CCT, um, and um, you don't get paid, of course, but you can always come back, and I think that is amazing also. And then, of course, here it is, the small details. The great package of benefits is probably the salary, which is not bad. Um, our allowances, the pensions, the European schools that we have in Brussels and in Luxembourg, your kids can go to European schools where they already mix with other cultures, where they learn languages at a very early um, stage, and we have childcare facilities also. So how do you get to work for the EU? There's a single point, single point of entry, EPSO, the European Personnel Selection Office, and the entry is by open competition. As I've said before, there's the notice of competition, which is published on, the, um, on our website. They're organized in annual cycles, so you know throughout the year when it is coming up for you. So around um, spring, you keep going to our website to see, uh, if you haven't heard it anyway, when the competition is launched. Uh, and then you see the link here. The procedure takes between five to nine months, probably more towards nine months but it's much better than what it was before. It used to take like two or three years. Imagine. And it would take up your entire life. Um, this is really, I don't think, something I have to go into again. We saw it in the, in the graph with the three circles. But we have other possibilities to work for the uh, EU. So we also recruit temporary staff, uh, temporary agents. 
and contract staff. Now you see the three exclamation marks in red there. There is one at the moment because I was told there are a lot of engineers in the room. Hands up, who's an engineer? Uh -huh. You want to go to that link? Very good. If you don't know already, there is a, a contract staff um, procedure right now that you can apply for. We have traineeships that was already mentioned before. They take about five months. Um, these people, the trainees, have an, a ball. I mean, in Brussels already, they have an amazing network. They learn a lot. They also get to know people within the institutions, which is not bad. Um, there's a small pay, and that depends, I believe, on the institution. I'm not sure um, whether they all pay for it, but I believe um, if there is a pay, it's actually it's quite small, but in any case. You can be seconded as a national expert, typically between two and four years. Um, and then we also um, recruit interim staff for up to six months. And there, if you go onto our website, uh, you can see which agencies or, um, deal with the selection of interim staff for us. In order to stay up to date with us, I invite you to um, join us on our Facebook page. We have already way over 65,000 fans, so become one of them. We have um, raconteur. We have um, a blogging that's going on where raconteur um, tell about their experiences. So basically, raconteur means somebody who's who's telling you about well their experiences. Yes, um, and then of course we have tweets. The links are coming up. Here they are. Um, and as I say, I think I'll leave the slides so that maybe you can just get the links. If nothing else, you can get the links off of the slides. Um, and there's a little video also of officials in the EU institutions, which is interesting to watch. Yes. This is an, a video that my director, who was supposed to come today and couldn't come, by the way, he's apologizing for that. He likes to show people, but I don't think we have time for it. But when you get the link, have a look at it. It's very interesting and very entertaining. So, muchas gracias. Si tienen preguntas... Acabo de preguntar, ¿hay, uh, ¿hay tiempo? Sí que queda tiempo. ¿Hay preguntas? Manos arriba. Muy bien. Ahí hay un micrófono, un segundo micrófono. Ahora sí. Ah. <risa> Muchas gracias. Es una pregunta muy simple en cuanto al, al idioma en el que se realizan los, los exámenes, el, el CBT, es en tu lengua materna, pero eso es en todo caso o solamente si te presentas en tu país. Quiero decir, si yo estoy viviendo en Francia, ¿puedo hacer ese examen también en español? Debes presentarte en tu leng primera lengua, en tu... No nos gusta decir lengua materna. Es... es... It's up to you. Es a ti de, por de, por, um, de decidir cuál es tu primer lengua. Um, por ejemplo, a ver, ¿cómo lo digo? Conozco mucha gente. Yo, yo no, soy alemana y he vivido casi, bueno, hasta que tenía 19 años en, en Alemania. Entonces, realmente mi primera lengua era el alemán. Pero hay mucha gente que son de padres españoles, por ejemplo, y viven en Francia. Entonces, puede ser que su primera lengua, en la que, en la que son lo más, hablan lo mejor y escriben lo, lo mejor puede ser de francés, es a cada uno de decidir cuál es su primera lengua. Muchas gracias. Lo, lo que, creo que tengo la respuesta, pero me quiero asegurar. La cuestión es si, si, eh, si yo vivo en España y decido que mi primera lengua no es el español, en un centro en España se puede hacer en otra lengua el examen. Sí, gracias. Sí.
I have a question on the experience required for AD7. If you are taking a, if you have got your degree, let's say eight years ago, then you pass a competition in the national administration and you have been working as a lower level, as equivalent of a AST in the European Union, that experience could be counted, uh, would be counted to, uh, towards the AD7? I'm going to have to be very careful with, uh, with my answer here. Uh, we're actually, the answer is probably no. Um, your work experience has to be at the level of the competition. In fact, it has to be at the level of the competition that you're applying for. So work that you have done at AST level, um, where you cannot show that you did AD work, will probably not be counted. Now it's always uh, the, up to the discretion of the selection board to check the work experience, whether it is counted or not, but this is a general thing. Yes, the, the level has to be at the level of the competition you're applying for. But then in the case of uh, people working for the uh, private sector, how is this checked? Because you could be working as, a, let's say, a secretary, but this could never be seen because there is no way to, to check. So people working for the public sector any national administration could be in disadvantage in this regard. You have to, when you um, talk about your work experience, you have to put d detailed information about what kind of work you did. Um, and believe me, they have, they have very good guidelines on how to judge w at what level, um, and also experience, of course, at, to judge at what level you've been working. There's, that is taken into account um, you know, whether people have been working in, the in, in any institution or an organ international organization or the private sector. So basically, here it is again, when you do your online application and it comes to the work experience, be very careful uh, of how you put down the information. Be very detailed. Let me tell you, the, ap the application form, to fill that out, it can take up to two hours. And that's something I wanted to say also. Don't be stressed. Switch off your phone, switch off your GSM, Tell everybody to leave you alone when you do that. It has to be done with a lot of um, thought. And do it at a certain at a, at a point in time where you know you're not interrupted so that it doesn't crash so you have to start all over again. Uh, what else can I say? I'm just putting a lot of emphasis on that because the application form is very, very inter important. Does that answer your question a little bit? Okay. Just a quick question. Do you include uh, engineers in spatial science or only architects? And then a second question uh, is about the motivation letter. You say that it was important. And I think maybe you can say why. I didn't hear the first question. Could you say that again? I didn't get the first question. Puede volver una vez más? Porque no he entendido la primera pregunta. Mejor quizá en español. Eh, en eh, spatial science, o ciencias espaciales, traduzco yo, incluye ingeniería o solo arquitectura, o qué se entiende por spatial science. Y la segunda era sobre eh, la carta de motivación, eh, por qué es importante, que lo ha mencionado muy rápidamente. For the first question, I would refer you to the official journal because I'm not sure myself, I have to be honest there. And uh, in that case, it's much better to always go to the official journal and to see what requirements um, or special requirements are, are there. Um, I would not be able to answer that question, I'm afraid. The second one, the motivational letter, um, clearly, as I say, we're looking for people that are motivated and, and it'll come up in the interviews um, in the assessment center your motivation or non-motivation. So the motivation letter plus your performance in the assessment center um, will, dis will give a hint on you know, the motivation of people. That's why it's important. Is that clear? Yes. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> Thank you. Eh, quería preguntarle sobre Europass. Si puede sernos útil redactar nuestro currículum en Europass, eh, si hay que traducir nuestros títulos, nuestros, bueno, 
Eh, en fin, si, si nos puede hablar un poquito de Europass como herramienta para, para mejorar nuestra aplicación. Sí, Europass es it is a, an effective tool and a used tool, a useful tool. Um, when it comes to the titles of your your um, diplomas and everything, you do not have to translate them. Don't even try. No, not necessary. We we're in contact with um, there's a network. Um, and we're in close contact with them. We have one person in EPSO that specializes in diplomas. So all titles just about are known to us. And if we don't know them, we do our research, very detailed research, to see whether a diploma would be accepted or not. So you don't need to translate them. Hola. Sí. Aquí. Eh, yo tenía una, una pregunta, buenos días. Eh, yo quería saber si existe algún problema en aplicar a una oposición y de acuerdo a un perfil que exactamente no se ajusta al tuyo, un año, y al año siguiente aplicar, si, sal, si sale, a un perfil que se corresponda más con el tuyo. Es decir, si EPSO te coge manía por aplicar a un perfil que no se ajusta exactamente con el tuyo, pero crees que tienes alguna posibilidad y luego cuando ves que hay algo que se adapta más a ti, volver a aplicar eh, enfocándolo más a lo que a ti te interesa. Para nada, lo que no, no queremos son turistas. <risa> hay, hay gente que, que dice, se nota que no, hay otra vez la pregunta de la motivación un poco, ¿no? Que, que hacen oposición tras oposición para practicar, para, yo no sé, pasarse el tiempo casi, ¿no? Um, one thing I have to so we do not, no te cogemos manía nunca. <risa> um, Vuelvo al inglés un momento, quizás. Um, el self-assessment, is, it's there for you to see whether you have a chance in this competition also, right? So, let's say you apply for something that is not exactly um, your thing, your field. In the assessment, the self-assessment, you will see whether you have a chance or not. And it's done, it's deliberately because we... I mean, we want to fool, don't want to fool you into thinking, you know, you're going to make it. We want to give you an idea, let's put it that way, whether you think you will be able to pass it or not. But we don't have any problem with you applying again and again um, and finally making it, obviously, um, to, to be a laureate. One thing I have to say, and I didn't say it before, you may not have more than one EPSO account. That's very, very important. You can only have one EPSO account. Maybe today, I hope, I've excited you maybe so much about the EU careers that you go home and you create an EPSO account straight away if you don't have it already, and to have it ready and to see a little bit how it works already before you do an application. Última pregunta porque vamos un poco más de tiempo, ¿vale? Uh, good morning. I want to ask uh, about a language. You have spoken about the third language is always to promote, but uh, if you the, the one important language for the union is French. If you have, for example, knowledge, you will also access a better or you have more to do an exam in, the, in this language also. What? You, you do only the language in you, the exam in your language, and after that, the exam, the CBT, on the other language? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I'd mentioned that the, the CBT test is in your own language. So, sorry, in your first language. I always have to be very careful not to say mother tongue or own language. First language. So, the one that you, you manage the best. And this, the assessment center, I don't know whether I said it, but it's in your second language. Yes? Did I, I did say that, right? Yes. Yeah? But uh, if you, uh, you say the third language is to promote, but for example, the French, French is important for their community. So, if you have for example, a third language, if you would also be accessed uh, in this language in, before you are inside. Uh, no, you know. no, no, no. The third language can be, the knowledge of the third language can be there already. Great. If it's not, we offer um, language courses during working hours. Gratis. habíamos dicho, creo. Última que decían por allí y ya está. Venga, ahora ya sí que la última. ¿Esa es la última? Sí. Vale. Esa es la última. Hi. Um, I just have a a ver, un signo, no, no, no le veo. Ah, hola. Aquí. <laughs> Let me try in English as well. Um, um, could we apply to ED5 and ED7? And if we can, 
uh, would we have to do the case study twice uh, for each of them? You have to choose between 85 or 87. Um, yeah, you okay. have to choose. And that's, by the way, another thing. I mean, if that ever changed or the, the tweaks, the little details of each competition, I'm very careful here with what I say um, because you really need to read the official, journey evo uh, the official journal. You know, we test people whether they can speak and write clearly, and here I go. <laughs> anyway, you have to read the official journal to find out the exact details of the competition you apply for. But you have to choose, and there are competitions that are not comp compatible, and yet that's something you have to read. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.